Liston explained three major constraints that might be associated with the house project if it was undertaken in your city. List them, explain them, and then describe the influence these might have on the system's engineering effort associated with the house. As a reminder, a constraint is something that limits our options. Constraints can come from internal sources, like company policy or preferences, or they might come from external sources, like legislation, environments or adversaries. Of course, external systems may also constrain our design, which is why we're going to talk about external systems in Exercise 2. In a requirements context, constraints are often articulated as mandatory requirements in the relevant specification. Note that they are mandatory, that is, you don't have any choice but to comply with them. We must know what our constraints are as we progress through the systems engineering process so that our system is engineered to perform in the face of these mandatory restrictions. This list of possibilities is really endless and the point of the exercise was to get you thinking about constraints. We weren't trying to come up with a 100% complete list here. The main thing to be aware of that may have made your answers incorrect is that constraints are generally non-negotiable. We have no choice but to comply with them. For example, say you decided that you had a constraint about what colour to paint your house. You would need to look at why this limitation existed. If it was because your neighbour would prefer you to paint your house a cream colour, well, that's not really a constraint because you could choose to ignore your neighbour. After all, they don't control what colour you paint your house. Not in Australia, where I live anyway. If, however, there was a local council mandate prohibiting certain colours or specifying others, say to fit in with heritage requirements, for example, then that's a different matter. Colour would then be a constraint in order to be provided with council approval. When I'm thinking about constraints, I sometimes find it useful to look through a crystal ball, if you like, at all the life cycle stages and then quiz relevant stakeholders about any hard limitations that they're facing in those stages. Let's look at some examples that I've come across in my experience and then you can see how this may have been applied to the house project. During conceptual design, feasible solutions may be discounted because of constraints. For example, I've been involved with a project where a solution from a particular country was not considered because of trade restrictions that existed at the time between the relevant governments. Clients may have strong preferences or even mandated requirements that solutions come from a particular country. For example, most governments set targets for the involvement of their own industry in their larger projects, hence developing and supporting local industry. During preliminary and detailed design stages, specific parts of the system may be mandated and may not be open to consideration. For example, I've worked on a military project where a specific make and model of air-to-ground missile was mandated as being included in the design. Conventionally, systems engineering philosophy would promote solution independence in the requirement set, but sometimes there are good reasons for elements of the design to be mandated, such as in this case. During construction and production, we might be constrained by environmental laws and regulations. For example, I've worked on a project where the hours of work were limited due to noise legislation. Work was not allowed to commence before 8am and had to be completed by 6pm. Although not an engineering problem per se, workarounds, like including prefabricated elements in the design, helped us to accommodate the construction constraints and allowed us to complete the project on schedule. There will be plenty of constraints associated with the utilisation phase that may impact on the systems engineering program. I've worked on plenty of projects where the nature of the end user and their skills were taken into account in the design and development during preliminary and detailed design in particular. For example, I worked on a project to develop prototype vehicles. The vehicles needed to be engineered so that a person with a valid driver's licence was able to operate the vehicle. Apart from the anthropological considerations, this constraint resulted in the vehicle needing an automatic transmission. This was a constraint that was accounted for in the vehicle design. Disposal is always a challenge and typically riddled with constraints. If we are able to appreciate the likely constraints associated with disposal, we can try to account for them in the design. I was involved with a project that involved classified information processing. In order to make disposal of the computers easy at the end of the life cycle, a constraint was established that all computers that needed to store classified information would do so on removable hard drives.
This allowed the computers to be declassified very easily during disposal, making disposal of those machines much simpler. The concept of boundaries and interfaces is reasonably self-explanatory, especially when it comes to something as straightforward as a house. We looked at these ideas during this week's material and found that it's important to know exactly where the boundary between our system and the external system sits. As a reminder, we talked about using a simple graphical representation known as a context diagram to help us out. If you need to, you should go back to the presentation material and have a look at the context diagram that we talked about. There'll be some things that sit outside our boundary but are absolutely critical to our system. We call these things external systems. Sometimes external systems will place additional requirements or constraints on our system. We must know what those requirements or constraints are. Often they will be articulated in the form of an interface that explains exactly what the external system expects from us and what we can expect from the external system. This allows the external interface to be accounted for during the design and development process. If the external systems are not within our control, i.e. they're not within our organisation for example, then it's prudent to seek formal agreements about the interface with the relevant external organisation. This helps to avoid problems later in the systems engineering process where our system needs to connect to these external systems. Note that these agreements do not guarantee that there will be no problems, but they do help to reduce the chances of those problems occurring. In this exercise, have a think about our house project and identify and describe at least three external interfaces. Also describe how these interfaces may impact on the subsequent systems engineering process. As with the other exercises, there's a long list of possibilities here, but I hope the exercise gave you the chance to think about boundaries and interfaces and see what other people came up with. The sorts of things that I hope people would talk about included the boundary between our property and the neighbouring properties. This boundary may be a physical boundary, like a road or a river, but it could also be simply a line on a map that indicates where we're allowed to work within. Knowing where this is will be absolutely critical, so we'd probably engage experts like surveyors to tell us exactly where this boundary was. Other things that people should be thinking about are the interfaces between our house and the external systems. Examples include connections to power, telecommunications, water, gas, sewerage, stormwater and so on. Each of these connections will be specified by an interface specification. These specifications will describe how you are to connect to these government provided services. Of course, these are examples of physical interfaces because something physically crosses our boundary in the form of, in this case, wires, pipes, or something like that. Some people might have also included interfaces that do not exist in the physical sense, but still need to be specified. For example, the interface between our house and free-to-air TV and radio might be absolutely critical. That interface is in the form of electromagnetic radiation that must be intercepted, received, amplified, and processed from within the house. The interface will result in requirements for antennas and suitable cabling within the house, even though no one can actually see or feel that external interface. So I hope you identified a few of these interfaces and can see how boundaries and interfaces impact on the engineering of our systems.